Thank you so much, Mitch, for your leadership and inspiration. And I'll never live those words down. I'm, I'm just going to say right now, I don't think we'll ever beat that. <laughs> so, I'd like to introduce somebody who's going to introduce somebody, but I don't want to spend a lot of time because it's written up in your program, but I have to say that Senator Bob Plymel is the ultimate friend of education in our legislature. Um, all throughout my career as a teacher and then working at the Department of Education, the State Board, and now with the PEC, he's always you know, been a friend and challenging us to do better. And when I first came to the Department of Ed, we had a meeting with him and a State Board member. And I was warned and cautioned and um, lectured that I needed to be on top of, I needed to be my A game, have my research, have all my ducks in order, and do more listening than talking. So <laughs> that was great advice. Uh, Senator Plymel um, is a champion of education, as I said, for numerous years, and he currently so, uh, serves on the SRE board of West Virginia, and he's the treasurer. So I'd like to introduce him now so that he's the perfect person to introduce our keynote. Thank you. You know, I'm not sure that that's really great uh, when they say that, but uh, I was, uh, somebody was talking to someone the other day and they said, uh, you know, you're going to, uh, uh, have you ever worked with Bob Plymouth? And they go, yeah. I said, Oh, you always had to be prepared. Now, I don't know if that was good, bad, or indifferent, uh, but it is what it is. Um, thank you, Donna, and it's my pleasure to be here. And let me, uh, I'm going to do a little of, a lot of people do not understand the role of SREB or the history of SREB, and I'm going to give you a little bit of, uh, of, of a history. So I know there's some new legislators here that, that will, will not know this, and it's important to do this, but uh, it has certainly been my pleasure to serve on the executive board uh, as a West Virginia representative since 2002. I've been appointed by uh, six governors, or seven governors, uh, to the uh, SREB, either as a legislative advisory council or on, as executive com member, committee member, and uh, they got down so low that they needed somebody to treasure, and it just somebody that was there for a long time, and that's me. Uh, so it, since 2015, I've been the treasurer of SREB. Uh, SREB was created in 1948, 10 years after President Roosevelt's emergency council called the South the nation no number one economic problem. As the South moved from a rule-based economy to an urban-based industrial economy, state leader realized that if colleges and universities were able to meet educational demands of these changes, s southern states would not be able to compete. Uh, SRE is compri SREB is comprised of 16 states, so if you take Delaware, Maryland, West Virginia, Kentucky, and go south all the way to Florida, we go west all the way to Arkansas and Oklahoma and Texas. So you talk about a demographics of 16 states that now are leading the country demographically and every, everything else. Now the SREB serves, uh, and at the time it was only serving um, you know, higher education. Um, now the SRB serves uh, what I call pre-K to gray. Uh, which now that I'm getting there, I, I understand that. Uh, you know, in my 26 years in the Senate, West Virginia has been honored to have three governors serve as the, chair, as the chairman, Gaston Caperton, Cecil Underwood, and Joe Manchin. And I might add that Cecil Underwood is the only, one of only three governors that has served two terms. As a member of the search committee, it was my honor uh, to be introducing the 16th president of SREB. Uh, Dr. Pruitt uh, has amazed in an extensive policy assessment, instructional background in education in the local, state, and national levels that will, will benefit the board and, most importantly, the students across the 18 states represented by the SREB. That was a quote 
by Governor Be John Bell Edwards. John Bell Edwards is our chairman, and uh, we kicked off the search committee in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, uh, last year uh, while we were doing this, and it was in, I believe, uh, uh, early uh, in the fall when we did that. Stephen Pruitt started his education career as a high school chemistry teacher in Fayette County, Georgia. He served in several leadership roles at the Georgia Department of Education, including Associate Superintendent of Assessment and Accountability, the Chief of Staff as the Senior Vice President for Achieve, a nonpartisan education organization. He worked closely with state agencies and educators around the country to improve science education. As a native of uh, Georgia, Pruitt holds a bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of North Georgia, a master's degree in science education from the University of West Georgia. He's got Georgia pretty well covered, and then he went to another state. So uh, he got his doctoral degree in chemistry uh, education from Auburn University. Um, However, let me just sort of digress and tell you that one of the things in our interview process that really um, impressed me, when we were, uh, and it's a pretty in-depth uh, interview process, and one of the things that impressed me the most, having been the chair of education when No Child Left Behind came, and um, you know, it was, um, and then we had Race to the Top, and in Race to the Top, there were standards that were, were outlined. And in those standards, science standards were made. And this is, he worked with Achieve. Achieve is the, I mean, the science standards that came from his work, he was the leader of that team, are the only standards that have withstood the test of time throughout the continuum of this standards battles that we had a long time ago. And that's a true testament to his ability. He and his wife, Cecilia, have two children, both in college, and he has brought a new thoughtful energy to SREB. It is my honor to introduce my friend, Dr. Stephen Pruitt, the president of SREB. Thank you, Mr. President. Good morning. Let me slide that down a little bit. It is so great to be in West Virginia today. I appreciate the opportunity to be here, and uh, hopefully, I can say something that'll that'll matter. Uh, Bob, thank you so much for the, for the wonderful introduction, and, and thank you for not reading the full bio, because I always get nervous, because it sounds like I can't keep a job, um, because I've had a lot of great opportunities. I, I will tell you the most important job of the things that he listed there, though, was I was a high school science teacher. Um, and, and I say that, I always like to start off with that, because I, I need you to understand where I'm coming from. I'm going to talk a lot about policy today. But as it didn't matter if I was teaching high school science, chemistry, or working at the State Department of Education in Georgia, or at Achieve, or as the Commissioner of Education in Kentucky, at the end of the day, when every decision had to be made, I had pictures of kids in my head. In fact, I actually in my office have uh, my teacher corner, that, uh, especially when I was in Kentucky. That was where I went to make hard decisions. Um, in fact, it was sort of a joke because uh, sometimes my staff couldn't find me, and usually it's because I was back in the corner trying to think through accountability or whatever, and, and uh, it got to where they would just walk in and go, got a decision to make today, huh? Yeah, I do. And I had to get back there and, and really surround myself and remind myself what it was like to be in the classroom. So um, SREB is, uh, it, it's a, I got to tell you, it's a pretty cool place to work. It's actually um, one of the few places I've ever seen that, you know, so everybody loves to say they're nonpartisan. You know, I said this last night. Um, it's actually one of the few places I've ever seen that really is. Um, the, in fact, it's, it was funny, one of the first state visits I went on, I went to Lee and, and said, okay, so who are we going to meet with? And I, being a former commissioner of education, you know, it was always important to know who, what party you're talking to. And she said, you know, I don't know. We're going to have to go look that up. 
And I said, really? <laughs> she said, yeah, we just don't pay any attention to that. I said, you know what? I'm breaking myself of that habit. I don't want to know. Because it really does provide us the opportunity to, to, to really think about what are the common challenges we have in education. So I'm going to share some of that with you today. The other part that, that I love about SREB is we are really where practice meets policy. And that's a, that's a pretty cool place to be. Because I, I found a long time ago that, you know, no great education idea ever died in the vision phase. Think about that. You know, we have all kinds of great ideas, but it, uh, until we realize that actually um, it matters how things are put into practice, that things can just simply evaporate. So, sorry, you can't take the chemistry teacher out of it. <laughs> Any opportunity to blow something up, that, that's why, I mean, that's why you become a chemistry teacher. You can legally do that. So I want to talk to you a little bit this morning about a few things. Um, Bob's already talked about um, who we are. You know, one of the things that I think that is important, I just want to reemphasize, especially for some of our new legislators, is we are, one of the things I have found since I've been here is that people really do not understand that we are a, an interstate compact, meaning that 16 governors, 16 legislators, legislatures came together and created us. The reason why people come to us still after 70 years is because we were created by the states and for the states. And we were done specifically to advance knowledge and improve the social and economic level of the southern region. And that's a pretty, pretty heavy thing. In fact, one of the things I think that I've been pushing inside the organization is it's time for us to really get back to our roots and really make this a prominent part of our discussion. When we talk about the social and economic vitality of the South, that includes so many things. Obviously, we improve that through education, but it's not also, it's just education. It's also about making sure that, that we're taking care of the social and emotional welfare, taking care of kids in trauma. And those are some things I think you'll see that are going to be a little different for, uh, that we'll be doing at SREB. We are established in 48, so we've got a nice long history, and uh, I like pre-K to gray. I think I'm going to start using that. Um, but we actually have uh, some pretty cool programs that we do throughout. For instance, last year, your, the legislature um, provided funds for 25 students in West Virginia to participate in the Doctoral Scholars Program. It's a program that we uh, manage that uh, provides students of color uh, mentorship and, and provisions to pursue a PhD. And West Virginia fully takes advantage of that, and we really appreciate that. And, the idea with that is to support them to get their PhD, but then also to help them move into faculty positions. Because we know that diversifying that workforce is critical for our future. We do believe very much that we can do more together. Um, what SREB does is we don't come in to push an agenda. We actually come in and, like I said last night, we listen, we learn, and then we help you act. Um, but, but it really is, uh, and we recognize that what goes on in West Virginia is going to look very different than what goes on in other states. So that's why we talk about, we find customized solutions for common challenges. So we are really where that policy meets practice. Now, some things that we particularly care about is improving college and career readiness. That's a big, that, so we're actually doing our strategic plan right now. Um, the things I'm gonna show you are, are the things that are kind of the keystones to, to our strategic plan. Um, we haven't gotten it approved by Bob and the rest of the executive committee yet, so. I, I'm not using the full blown part here, but I will tell, the, tell you this. The process we're using to develop this is very similar to the process we use to work with our states. Uh, this isn't me and my leadership team sitting in a room developing this. This is us work, doing some stuff in that room, but then going out and having our staff provide feedback and direction, going out to our board and to our executive committee and then bringing all that back. So it's a very free flowing conversation. But we want to improve college and career readiness. We want to increase post-secondary attainment, including industry credentials and college degrees. Balance matters. One of the biggest problems in education is the pendulum. Now, I'm a, again, I'm a science guy, so pardon the, the, the analogy here, but you know, the, the way you measure a pendulum is by its period. So how far it swings from one side to the other. And in education, there's usually a large period. I personally believe that if you really are going to make change in education, you figure out how to shorten the period. 
That means that you react to the things your state needs to do, but you don't allow it to just swing because of the new bell and whistle that comes up. A great example is in Germany. Back in the 90s, Germany on the PISA, which is an international assessment for 15-year-olds, they scored at the bottom of all the industrial countries in, in science. So they decided they were going to put all kinds of funds toward that, and they did. And Germany became one of the top performers in PISA. But then they saw, oh, we don't have enough technical workers. So guess what they did? Put a lot of time and money into apprenticeships and all that. And probably some of you have even been over there to visit. Well, now there's some emerging research that now they've got, they've done that pretty well, but guess what? Now there are no scientists and engineers to create the new ideas for those technical people to do. So if we really want to make change in the, in the South, I think part of the key is going to be that we shorten that period. We want to expand ex economic prosperity by closing talent and opportunity uh, workforce gaps. That's a key thing for us. We work a lot with our states around accelerated pathways and, and career and technical education, but also in integrating and blurring those lines between career and technical education and traditional academia. This is going to be somewhat new for SREB, uh, improving the student learning environments. At the end of my presentation today, I'm going to talk a little bit about school climate and school safety. But I believe that we can't really do that first thing about college and career readiness until we start really addressing the student learning environment. In other words, making sure that our students are taken care of on a social and emotional level. And also, to be clear, that's also not just K-12. We actually have to improve our student learning environments at higher ed, too. And we want to support state policymakers. This is a really core function to what we do. Lee Posey, wait, everybody Lee. Lee is uh, our VP for uh, state services, and this is a real core piece to what we do. We want to be reactive to you, but we also are working really hard to, to be proactive so that we can help before you even know that you need the help. And finally, we want to provide research recommendations and services to inform state education policy and improve outcomes for students. So we want to be able to be positioned to help you whenever you need the help. Now, the things I'm going to talk about today, teacher preparation. We had a teacher preparation commission that was actually chaired by Governor Edwards. Um, I mentioned it a little bit last night. Uh, what a, the way a commission works for SREB is a, the chair sets a, a topic, and then we work with the research community and we bring together commissioners, which are members from our states, usually legislators from our states, and we cultivate a report that ends in recommendations. One of the things that, that I have a big belief in and that we're going to be pushing pretty hard is that we don't do just a commission and a report and publish it and make it pretty and send it out there and say good luck with that. We actually want to work with states who want to really put some time in to help implement in part or in whole what that commission report says. We have a changing workforce. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, a report that we're going to be releasing shortly after the first of the year that, in my opinion, this is going to be a, one of the biggest pieces of our work over the next five years. And hopefully, we're going to be able to work with you guys. And based on what our Senate President just said, I think this actually fits very well with what you guys are, are already targeting. And then finally, I'm going to end with school climate. I'm going to give you a little, just a little brief thing about this. I'm going to talk about school climate, but I'm going to talk about it in a way um, from a perspective of a former state chief state school officer um, who had to en endure and while it was also one of the worst days of my career, it was also one of the most inspiring in having to deal with a school shooting. So I'm going to share a little bit about that with you. But first, let's talk about the teacher prep commission. Now, <clears throat> here's the thing about teacher prep. Um, we all talk about it, have for a long time. So the time's going to come where either we need to stop talking about it or we need to do something about it. We spent two years looking at the research, and what I'm going to share with you are the recommendations that came out of that. First of all, around licensure. Now, I will share this with you first. I, uh, I got invited to go out to Seattle. They had a big teacher preparation uh, conference. Gates put it on, and uh, I went. 
And there was a lot of cool stuff they were talking about. In fact, a lot of it was stuff that really fits quite well with our recommendations. And um, when you get to know me, you know, I'm a pretty cool cucumber on most things. I'm, I'm pretty relaxed. I don't get real hyped up about anything, don't get really angry about anything. Yeah, I'm, just, I'm pretty, pretty level. But at the same time, I, I, there will be little things that will finally push me to a frustration point that I can't sit quietly anymore. And I had one of those moments at this conference. So we spent, you know, a couple of days talking about all this great stuff for teacher prep. And I'm sitting there and I keep waiting for somebody to talk about licensure, for somebody to talk about policy, for somebody to say the word legislator. Never happened. So finally, about midway through the second day, and I, like I said, I usually go to these things and I don't say a whole lot because I want to learn. And I finally, I, I stood up and I said, I'm sorry. I, I don't mean to be a, a killjoy on this, but I've got to ask this question. Have any, and there was a panel up there. I said, have any of you discussed any of this with your legislators, your, your licensure agency, your, your, your higher ed organization? And they all stare at me. And I couldn't figure out if they were saying, ah, oh, shoot, we were hoping nobody would ask that. Or if they were going, oh, we hadn't thought about that. But finally one of them spoke up and said, yeah, we think we probably should do that, but we haven't yet. So here's the thing. The role of a state agency, state legislators, here, here's the, you know, this is my personal perspective. This maybe I shouldn't say this is an SREB perspective. This is Stephen's perspective. One of the biggest roles you play is ensuring equity. So we can have all kinds of great practice, but if we don't do something that actually puts some pressure on folks to hold a standard that actually provides equity for everybody, then I think that we're sort of missing the boat a little bit. So with licensure, the big recommendation is hold all new teachers to the same standard, no matter their route into the profession. So whether they're coming in from the four-year university or whether they're coming in through alternative certification, hold them to the same standard. In other words, don't make one way really easy for them to get their degree. I'm living this in real time right now. My wife was a pharmacist for 28 years. She decided when we moved to Atlanta to the SREB, and she's talked about it for a long time. Um, she's always been quite the inspiration for me, and now I just don't know that I know a more courageous person. After 28 years, she's now teaching high school physics. And so I'm living this. And so, of course, you know, I actually have to be a little bit careful at home. Y'all know how that goes. You know, she's looking at what program to go into, and I'm going, well, you know, we got to make sure it's a good, high, reputable program that holds to a high standard. She's like, I need to get my certification. I'm like, I, I, I get that, but I'm about to come out with a report that says everybody's got to be held to the same standard, so you're not going to go to one of those fly-by-night groups. Okay, but what if it's cheaper? <laughs> Moral dilemma. No, 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 no. It doesn't matter if it's cheaper. We've got we to we we hold to a standard. So some things. We require all teacher candidates to meet the same high criteria for initial licensure. Now, this is very focused on initial licensure. Okay, I want to be clear about that. Because one of the things with commissions, it's really easy for them to mushroom into very large things. So one of the things we try to do is keep it pretty specific. So this is about initial licensure. Um, whether their preparation is traditional, alternative, undergraduate, post-baccalaureate, or graduate. This is important, too, because in particular in the areas of career and technical education, that's where we see a lot of our alternative uh, education people. In fact, in Kentucky, we get a complete revamp of how we certify our, our CTE teachers, which has been really effective. In fact, I'll, I'll, I'll brag a little bit here. Um, when I got there, we were having about a 70% retention rate over uh, from our CTE teachers. We, when we changed everything, and it was hard. In fact, I have never in my life been called a bully, but I was at, for this one thing because we were at our licensure board and I was really pushing. It was one of the, 
very rarely did I pull out the, the commissioner card and really push on something like that for another, in another agency. But I did, and uh, I had a couple people say, well, you bullied your way through that. And I'm like, yeah, but you know what? It was for kids, and so that's actually okay. And what happened is in the last two years, we had a 90% retention rate because they actually were better supported but we also held a higher standard. They didn't just walk through a bunch of courses that ended up in a, in a license. They actually learned things about project-based learning. Because I'm thinking, how does a CTE teacher not know about project-based learning? It's a project. All of CTE <laughs> is a project. How do you not even discuss that? So we made that change. Adopt a practice-based assessment for teacher readiness. Now, this is going to be a pretty significant discussion. This means that it's not enough just to go take a certain certification test to decide whether you have the content knowledge or not. This is actually proving that I can teach. You know, you can have a lot of knowledge, but can you actually disseminate it? One of the worst physics teachers in history, in history, was Albert Einstein. If you don't believe me, go read any book about his time of teaching in Princeton. He was horrendous. But was there anybody, maybe in the history of the world, that knew more about physics than Albert Einstein? No. So this is about using a practice-based assessment, not just that they can pass the test that's written, but they can actually show you that they can do the work. Identify a continuum of teacher development and link it to the licensure system. In other words, Think about how should teacher growth be done. Not just the fact that they pass that initial, but then how do you actually talk about a continuum? Second was, is about clinical experiences. Place all teacher candidates in high quality clinical experiences. This doesn't mean a six week student teaching. This means putting them into a clinical, maybe for a year, where they do something like what we see in medical school, where they actually are a resident. And maybe they're actually even being paid to actually work for that year to really hone their skills but also be under the guidance of veteran teachers. I mean, I know me personally, I, mean, I still feel like I owe a letter of apology to every kid I taught the first three years I taught because I did some crazy stuff. I mean, if any of you are science people in here, you'll appreciate this. For some reason, I got it in my head that I should teach isomers to ninth graders. Let me just tell you, for those of you who don't know, that was one of the dumbest ideas that I could have ever had because it meant nothing to them except basically I taught them how you can still play with tinker toys as an adult. Um, so require programs to place candidates in high quality clinical experience, develop and offer support and training for mentor teachers and provide uh, or effectively guide prospective teachers. If the state funds stipends for full year residencies, prioritize any available funding for candidates who intend to teach in hard to staff schools. So, you know, one of the things you have problems with, with when kids come out of college is they all want to go teach in their student teaching at, you know, the affluent or uh, suburban school. Well, we don't really, I mean, you think about how we train medical staff. They do their rotations. They don't go just to you know, the nice family physician in town, they have to spend time in the emergency room. They have to spend time in the trauma unit. So maybe if you think about doing something like this, and again, I know this is contingent on the unlimited need. I loved how you said that. I'm gonna steal that from you. That, you know, there's this unlimited need, but this would be something if you decide to go there, it's a way to help prioritize where those funds go. And then uh, require programs to report on the quality of those clinical experiences. Now, I know as higher ed, that's a little bit, um, you know, that can be a little bit scary uh, because we're saying, you know, there actually should be some accountability there. But it gives an opportunity for, the, for people to see how that, those programs, how effective they are. Data systems bring together data from across the state and local agencies to inform improvement. Data is always going to be a big deal. Um, I think it's something that we all grapple with. I was very lucky in Kentucky in that we had a very robust data system, but I also know that we have a lot of our states in the South that are really working toward having that robust system. Um, 
implementing a statewide data system that synthesizes data on uh, teacher development from various state and local agencies, disseminate that data widely, tailored to the needs of specific audiences, empower change and expect improvement, and then finally, partnerships. You actually can't do this, this stuff without quality partnerships. Encourage strong partnerships between teacher prep programs and local school districts. States should provide incentives and support for strong partnerships between teacher preparation programs and local school districts. Now I want to say, I want to remind you of something right here. So this is states should provide incentives. Now for my legislative friends in the room, I want to be clear Now, your legislative colleagues are the ones that came up with these recommendations because any time that I stand on the stage and, have to, and say what states should do with funding, I want to be clear. SREB put this on the paper after y'all told us to do it. So just so before any of you come back later and say, now, Stephen, why are you telling us? I didn't do it. I'm just reporting it. So teacher prep um, is a major deal. And I know that there's been a lot of conversation already here. I do want to share with you that one of the things that we are doing, remember earlier I mentioned that we're not going to do just a commission report and then move into um, Good luck with that. We actually started just this week in, on Monday. We have, we have a grant um, with, uh, uh, with Gates, but now we actually have another grant to support North Carolina where we are creating an Education Human Capital Roundtable. And with that, SREB is bringing together all the state agencies and important, and for those of you who weren't here last night, I use shareholder instead of stakeholder because I want to build uh, where they actually feel invested in, in something. And all we do is bring them together and facilitate a process and document that process and help them get that going. With the idea that we exit and that continues going in that state, but the focus on that is actually for them to take the commission report and build this round table and really work through some of these really hard issues around licensure and, and data and all that stuff. So that may be something that, that you want to consider here in West Virginia. The hardest thing is to get people to work together sometimes and I will, I will tell you that I think one of the best things Sonny Perdue ever did in, as governor of Georgia was created the alliance of agency heads and gave them the directive. You're going to do X, Y, and Z. You can't, send any pro you can't send any proxies. You've got to be there and you've got to get this work done. And that's sort of what we're trying to create except we're not giving a, the mandate. We are actually saying this is what we think we should do to help you. Now, next big thing is a changing workforce, in particular around adult education. Already we've heard, in fact, I'm sitting there listening to, to Gail this morning and, and some of the conversation last night, and the fact that artificial intelligence has already been brought up is awesome. Um, because a lot of things that we're, I'm about to talk about are really going to be affected by how automated things are and how much AI actually will play a role. The future we face is that the change, there are changes in the demands of the workforce and that the realities of the need for a scientifically literate society are really more and more evident. In other words, we've got to make sure that kids are able to learn more than just a skill. They actually have to learn to learn. We have to think about K-12 from the perspective of, so everybody loves to say this. Every conference I've ever been to, somebody gets on stage and says, we are preparing kids for jobs that we don't even know. Have y'all all heard that? And aren't you always amazed that the person saying it acts like they're the first person that's ever said it? Well, I'm going to go the other direction. We have to quit preparing kids for jobs we know aren't going to be there. See, that's, to me, that's even a, a bigger problem. If we're going to continue to have kids going into, into jobs that we know aren't going to exist, whose fault is that? That's us. So, researchers from Oxford said advances in robotics and AI hold the potential to reshape fundamentally the way we live and work. We cannot yet foresee exactly how this fourth industrial revolution will play out. We know that gains in productivity and efficiency, new services and jobs, and improved support in existing roles 
are all on the horizon alongside the potential loss of well-established occupations. Now the reality is what a lot of us ask is will there be enough jobs? Because the perception with AI and, and robotics is they're kicking people out. They're going to replace people. But see, the thing is that's not actually the right question to ask. It's not about will there be enough jobs because that's not what's happening. Robots aren't going to kick us out of the workplace. What it does is actually it, it creates a scenario where the skill level of our populace has to be accelerated because robots and AI create more jobs than actually we lose. Now, but the thing is, because we think about the unemployment rate and who those people are, we have to rethink about how we're going to train them. So what I'm setting up here is this is a K-12 issue for us to make sure that we rethink how we're training those kids. But here's the other reality. Right now we have people 25 to 35 who have jobs who are making a reasonable living. That in the next decade they are going to lose those jobs because they will not exist. Now think about that. These folks that are, that are have high school diplomas, they have a job that right now they think is, is pretty good, they're going to lose those in the next decade. Guess what else happens in the next decade? Their kids graduate high school. Look at the double whammy that's coming. Unemployment for people who then will be 35 to 45. Their kids coming out of school and if they're not prepared, we know that kids who come from families where their uh, parents have low, low skill jobs are 10 times more likely to have the same jobs. You're looking at a potential multi-generational unemployment issue. See, the right question is, will there be enough people with the skills to fill those jobs? That's actually the question we have to ask. So in entry-level positions since the, the Great Recession, we lost 4.8 million jobs from people who had high school diplomas. 300,000 that had some college or associate's degree and actually didn't lose many that had bachelor's degree or more. Gain jobs though, since then, 3.5 million. Okay, so we've come back some. 1.2 million. But look at how many gain jobs and, and bachelor's degree or more. Now, the thing is, I want to be clear. I'm not pushing that every kid goes to college in any way, shape, or form. But what I hope you see up there, though, is the thing is that, if you, that there's going to be a requirement that there is some type of post-secondary training. That doesn't mean that they, you know, some of it's a certificate. Some of it is community college. Some of it is college. But this is why I was talking about that, that pendulum earlier. Finding balance is actually going to be important. Since the recession, the blue line down there lost 7.3 million jobs. Now, since, since the recovery, we've added 8 million. But you've added 1.2 million. And look, look at how steady that associate's degree or some college was. There wasn't a lot of loss. So those people could survive the recession. And then people with bachelor's degree or higher added 4 million jobs. Here's the, this, to me, this is the most telling graph. We had 5.6 million people lose their jobs at high, had a high school diploma or less. Only 80,000 got those jobs back. You know why? There weren't any jobs for them to get. Those jobs went away. After the recovery of the recession, it wasn't because those, I mean, well, some of it might have been because they chose not to go back into the workforce. But a lot of it, they simply did not have those jobs to go back to. Like I said, I was in Kentucky. And I know that in eastern Kentucky, when the recession hit and when coal went down, there were a lot of people out of work. And there has to be more of a focus on helping those folks find a better career and have a different level of training. So when you look at this, 
People who have a high school diploma or less, there was a net loss of 4.8 million jobs. But if you had some college or certification, and understand when I say college, I don't mean you know, four year. I'm talking about technical college, certificate training, industry certs, all that kind of stuff. And then you had people who really could withstand that fall came with there was if there was the proper training. The reality is that automation is going to really make a big difference. It's going to take up more than 40 percent over the next 10 years of the, of the jobs that are out there. But it's also going to create a lot more jobs if we have the right people in those in those jobs. This is the thing that, that hits me and I shared this with our Legislative Advisory Council a couple weeks ago. I think that we're headed for a multi-generational cliff. If we're not careful if we don't do things in K-12 to make sure that we're preparing kids for college and career and helping kids see what careers are actually out there and we don't do anything now. See, I mean, it'd be really easy to say, well, we're going to wait 10 years and see what happens. And what's going to happen is we're going to end up with a recession. Now, if I, and I'm planning on this, but, you know, assuming that my career goes the same way that my five predecessors at SREB, we're 70 years old. I'm only the sixth president. So I'm probably going to be here in 10 years. And my hope is I'm not standing on a stage in West Virginia or anywhere else and saying, remember 10 years ago when we said this was coming? It's here. So my hope is that this is one of the things that, that you guys will take on about how we can really think about this. We've got some great opportunities, but sometimes in an increasingly complex world, sometimes an old question requires a new answer. Sometimes it's not as simple as two plus two, but we have some great opportunities. The federal statutes right now around Every Student Succeeds Act, which hopefully all of you have been a part of, Talks about K-12 education, academics and well-rounded education, college and career readiness. But Perkins 5 has been reauthorized. And I don't know how much y'all have been involved with that. This is a great opportunity because maybe for the first time in history, we have three laws that actually intentionally had the same language so that you could leverage these things. In Perkins, it's about career and technical education. Secondary and post-secondary for youth and adults. And it's about college and career readiness. We also have the Workforce Innovation Opportunity Act that was passed in 2014, designed for secondary and post-secondary education for youth and adults, workforce training, career readiness, and success. There are states who are developing what they're calling a unified plan. Because here's what happens. ESSA, and I was in charge of ESSA when I was state chief in Kentucky, and let me tell you, my legislators were well involved. I mean, I was testifying monthly about where we were on progress and should have been. I want to be clear about that. I, I joke with Mike Wilson about it all the time that, you know, dragged me in front of those committees constantly. And, you know, but you know what? He should have because it was about school accountability for the state of Kentucky. But that's not happening with Perkins, which right now, State agencies are developing. And if our legislators and other shareholders around the state aren't involved with that, and if that's only happening in CTE and they're not doing it across the agency to make sure it's aligned with their ESSA plan, you're missing an opportunity. Then add that too to the workforce, to, to WIOA, which actually is usually not in the State Department of Education, it's usually over in labor. As legislators, you've got an opportunity to, to, I hate to use the term, but demand that these programs are aligned and effective and have the opportunity to actually push your state forward by leveraging all those things. You even have opportunities in how you write other grants. Department of, uh, of Agriculture uses the SNAP grants. If you write that plan right, you can actually use SNAP grant funds to pay for student meals while their, kid, while their parents are being trained for other jobs. So if you're, you've got kids in poverty who, are, who aren't going to be able to have dinner, you can actually use those grants to do that. But this is where there's a diligence that has to come, and, and hopefully that's a place that if you, if you would like it, we're, ha we're happy to help you with that. And of course, it's also about economic development. 
So connecting these points, when you think about it, and we're happy to provide uh, some more information about this, but among these things, governance, the programs, equity, accountability data and improvement, and timing, those five things are really great points of intersection among those three federal statutes that can really help propel West Virginia and uh, our, the South forward. And I'm going to end with this, and I, so I'm almost finished. Um, school climate and school safety are obviously something that's big. When, you know, I told you last night that you know, one of the things we do is we listen. And we want to be able to, to provide you what we need to provide you. Far and away, this was the most requested thing for us. Uh, when we surveyed the, our states and said, what are the things y'all are grappling with? School climate and student safety, way out of everything else. Now, I'm not going to get into some of the, the, the discussions that you'll have politically. You know, we're not gonna, I'm not here to talk about who you arm and who you don't and all that. But what I am going to share with you is that there are th really three dimensions of school climate. There's the physical space, there's relationships, and there's instruction. And at the end of the day, it's all about leadership. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the relationship part. Remember I said earlier that I don't believe we can really get college career readiness unless we actually take care of the school environment? And this is part of what I'm talking about here. Um, I think that if we're going to ever really make a difference in helping our students graduate ready for whatever the next step is, we've got to do more effective things around counseling. Um, in Kentucky, I don't know how it is in West Virginia, but in Kentucky, our counselors spent most of their time coordinating assessments. They were, um, they were the assessment coordinators. I remember walking into the Department of Ed one day and I'm just kind of scrolling through Twitter, and I'm seeing all these counselors saying, hey, I'm at the KDE testing uh, meeting today. And I'm like, what are all these counselors doing at this testing meeting? And then I found out, well, that's actually who they use to, to do the state tests, to do the local interim assessments, the MAP tests, and all that. So I'm like, when are they having time to counsel? Well, the reality is they weren't. Um, of course, that means if we were to do something for that, we means we have to also support our schools in finding a way to help get that part done. Tennessee has passed a law that says that 80% of the time of the counselor should be spent on counseling duties. Personally, I think that's a fantastic law. In fact, I think if I'd stayed in Kentucky, I probably would have pushed that pretty hard. I will tell you, however, I didn't always have that opinion. In fact, Full truth, when I was a teacher and when I was at the Georgia Department of Education, I probably spent more time complaining about high school counselors than I did being a proponent of them. And it wasn't until I started realizing what we were asking them to do and what we were not preparing them to do that I started realizing that may be the problem. So maybe this isn't Stephen being irritated with counselors because the counselors aren't doing their job, maybe it's because we weren't preparing counselors to be able to do their job. And I think this came in the greatest relief for me on January the 23rd of this, pa of this year. Um, January 24th to the 26th, I spent time at Marshall County High School after we had a shooting on January 23rd. And I saw one of the most horrendous experiences that an educator ever goes through. Um, shooting happened on the 23rd. I didn't go down to the 24th because I felt like I would have been more of a problem. I went down, um, I went down in jeans and a button down because I didn't go down as commissioner. I went down to, to, to work, to do whatever they needed to do. And they asked us to go sit with the counselor. I took my chief academic officer and I had a person who was specifically in charge of coordinating counseling activities in Kentucky. I'm gonna tell you that's probably the best decision I ever made as the Commissioner of Education, was to have somebody who, not in name only, coordinated counselors, but actually their sole job was to train counselors, to coordinate the activities, to make sure that they knew what was going on in the, in the other parts of the agency and communicating that to the counselors. 
because what she ended up doing was having to coordinate for the rest of the year through May counselors from all over the state of Kentucky going to Marshall County to support those kids. If we hadn't had that, we'd have been in trouble. Well, more specifically, Marshall County would have been in trouble. I went down there. We go into the meet with the counselors. They had this incredible plan for counselors for 2,000 kids. How do you deal with trauma? And, and, and the trauma that we're dealing with are ranged from I went to school at Marshall County and I kind of know the people that happened to, to a young lady who stood six feet from the shooter, who I personally got to meet, and I don't know to this day how she put one foot in front of the other. She stood six feet from the shooter, and she told me he ran out of bullets. If he had not run out of bullets, I wouldn't be standing here today. She was so petrified, she couldn't even fall to the ground. She stood six feet and from the shooter's perspective saw him take out two of her classmates. How do you help that child when you have four counselors and 2,000 kids? Well, this is where the state role comes into play. We all get into talking about prevention. I want to I pitch to you a different thing. There are actually three phases of crisis, and it doesn't matter if you're talking about a shooting, a tornado, a hurricane, a flooding. It's that you first deal with prevention. You have to deal with management. And I'll tell you, the people at Marshall County High School, from everything that we saw, and, the, and we talked to the state police, as we watched the video, all that, those two things, they, they could not have done any better. But then there's that third phase. See, everybody showed up. You know, the day of the shooting and, and the day after, we had tons of people showing up. They all had cards. Um, this, at the Legislative Advisory Council, we had the, the two of the counselors and the principal and the superintendent on a panel, and they were like, well, our pockets were full of cards where people came and said, hey, I'm here, I want to help you. No, they had no idea who they could trust. In fact, one of the biggest things that we ended up doing while we were down there was vetting who should be coming in and out of the school. And what I learned was at a state level, I had fallen down on my responsibility to help asset map for our districts. Who do you call? So they're just laying out this great plan, and I'm sitting there in the room with them, and I'm saying, how are you going to pull this off? you got four counselors. They said, we could use some more. I said, you think? They said, yeah. I said, how many do you need? Can you find us five? I said, five? You got 2,000 kids. 10? Stepped out in the hallway, made two phone calls. We had 32 counselors there by 10 o'clock the next morning. Okay? I'm not saying that in any way to say what Stephen did. I'm saying that to say there are people who are dying to help if the right people make the phone calls. So, what we started doing then was we're going to have a plan for what happens for crisis resolution. That third phase is what I call crisis resolution. In fact, um, we learned a lot from that. We had one regional education agency that actually already had a trauma-trained set of counselors. And now they're actually doing, going out and doing the training in the other service agencies. But the state actually has to, a role to play there. The state has to do that. So whatever your conversations around student safety, what I want to encourage you to do is from a guy that lived it, think about how you help with resolution. Think about how you help these folks figure out what to do after. Because here's the thing. Two days after the shooting on January 25th, you know how many people were still there? Us. The news had gone home. All these people with cards had gone home. And it was the state that was left to help. And until May, until school let out that year, my person that was in charge of counselors coordinated trauma-trained counselors from across the Commonwealth to come to that school. And that's a deliberate decision that has to come from policymakers. So I just want to encourage you, as you have those conversations, don't have the other conversations you need to have about prevention. I'm not telling you you shouldn't have those. But I'm telling you, though, we, these folks need help after. And it doesn't matter if it's, a, if it's a car accident, suicide, all the way up to the most extreme of, of a school shooting. These districts and schools need your help and support. 
I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you giving me an opportunity to come speak to you today. And I love the opportunity to work with West Virginia as much as you want us to work with you. Um, this is my information. Um, and Lee, who waved at you a few minutes ago, this is her email and phone number. We're happy to be here and help you in any way we can. Uh, we want to support you. In fact, um, and I'm, here it is. If any of you are interested, we do a publication on each individual state. One of the reasons why SREB, I think, has, has survived the way it has is you have our commitment. We don't do rankings and comparative and all that, but we are honest with you about what's going on in your state. And this is actually a, a publication we do each year that, that gives you a little bit deeper dive of what is happening in West Virginia. Um, there's a lot of cool stuff. I mean, as being part of this, you know, your, your students and agencies actually saved $1.8 million last year just on uh, uh, being a part of NC SARA, which actually allows our, our universities to, our students in our universities to take online courses in other states without doing uh, out-of-state tuition. Uh, the academic common market, the part, being able to be a part of a technology consortium where your state actually saves, or each institution saves hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. We're happy to continue to do that, but we want to, uh, we want to make sure that you are well aware of all that. So if Lee has this document. If you're interested, we can also give you some details about the kinds of savings that, that you get too. I don't, I don't mean that to sound like a commercial, but, but there are great things that do go on in West Virginia, and, and it, and, but there are also things that we can work on and that we can help you with. So thank you again. I know I went a little over and I apologize.